inventing and innovating. You can't find anything unless you are looking for it, geologists say. The startup initiation or birthing experiences have been told for three modes. What do those stories tell us? Imagine a brainstorming session. To follow are some points we might hear. Think of them as characterizing phase one of the larger story of the life cycle of a system. The preceding chapters have emphasized events, actors doing things at places and times. These were creative events, things that mattered in the emergence of modern transportation systems. Chapters to follow will have similar emphases. Events may be interesting, but they stand alone unless knitted into systematic ideas, and we strive for systematic ideas about the behaviors of actors and systems. The present chapter will begin our emphasis on systematics. Using definitions, assertions, and speculative remarks, it will ask the reader to muse with us about the nature of invention and innovation. We'll repeat this pattern in subsequent waves of the book as the transportation experience unfolds. There are multiple models for innovation and invention. Robert Fulton did not invent the steamboat. The credit for invention should go to William Simonton or others who worked earlier, such as James Rumsey or John Fitch. Fulton innovated a rather crude design suited to a market niche. Social innovation followed. We have used the words invention and innovation and should remark on them and use them carefully. Though the words are often used synonymously, the difference between invention and innovation is slippery but important. An invention, from the Latin for to find, is a new process. Usability is not at issue. But usability must be in the back of the inventor's mind because inventors are social beings. A major new technology or invention requires the use of a new principle. An innovation, from the word for introducing something new, assembles processes to work in markets. An innovation has both soft and hard technology aspects. Some say that invention differs from innovation because the latter is clearly derivative. We prefer to think of them as creating building blocks, invention, and bundling building blocks, innovation, into a larger assembly. Of course, today's bundled building blocks serve as components in tomorrow's even more complex systems. Both invention and innovation can be contrasted with discovery. A discovery finds something that existed but was previously unknown, whereas both invention and innovation create things that did not previously exist. Many innovation paradigms exist for basic and applied research and for individuals and large organizations. Historically, the dominant paradigm was what we now call the innovator in the garage view, a lone worker or small team working in an appropriate space, a garage, a shed, etc., develop something new or adapt something to a new use. Steamboats, steam engines, even steam cars followed this view. This carried forward to modern times as the founding stories of Hewlett Packard and Apple. This is a view that things just happen without direct intervention. Of course, there are incentives, both private and public. Patents, monopolies, and prizes are evidence of that. But direct government support or policy was not necessarily required, except to the extent of providing a legal framework and ensuring a civil society. This paradigm evolved, especially with the emergence of complex systems. The innovator and assistants in the garage became a large team in a laboratory. Innovation became corporate. This is the model we associate with Thomas Edison and Menlo Park. The end-driven paradigm, such as used by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, and the U.S. Department of Defense, states that the desired end and applies resources to get there, including the resources to perform research and development. Examples include the U.S. space program, which was tasked with putting a man on the moon before the end of the decade of the 1960s. In more conventional transportation, the Federal Highway Administration Automated Highway Systems Program, described in the technology chapter, adopted this paradigm. In contrast, the means-driven paradigm, followed by government science agencies like the National Science Foundation and the National Institute of Health, says, encourage and support research in promising areas with a nominal goal, but don't worry too much about the goal and social advances will follow. This is a widely held view by individuals in universities and industry laboratories. The Defense Advanced Research Programs Administration, DARPA, used this when funding the development of what became the Internet. We can think of two motifs for invention of technologies, Darwinian and Kuhnian. The motifs involve technologies adapting by adjusting internal parts so that novel structures arise from recombinations. The Darwinian mechanism involves new technologies like species arising from selected variations of the old. The Kuhnian mechanism involves paradigm shifts as old technologies like scientific theories 
meet anomalies and are replaced by new ones. The Darwinian incrementalist motif fails in a number of cases. Schumpeter writes, add successively as many mail coaches as you please, you will never get a railway thereby. Nevertheless, there is an evolution of sorts in a selection process, even if there is also planning and design on the parts of designers in contrast with biological evolution. Another view is to think of the innovation within the supply chain of suppliers, makers, and users. Innovations can come from any of these parties, and in some segments, come from users more than makers. Experience says that these and other views are correct. There are multiple models for innovation and invention. It also tells us some things many don't want to read. The first is that, in certain situations and for certain sorts of outcomes, ought to preface statements of principles. Second, that technology is, after all, a creature of society, just as society depends on technology, and improving on the success of an innovation is very much a desired social activity. Therefore, successful innovations stimulate research to improve them. Essential knowledge may follow innovation. The people orientation in the previous chapters was deliberate because we would like to know what kinds of activities and actors yield consequential change. What's the conclusion? In what ways does rational linear thinking, for example, Smeaton's, occasion progress? What about more integrative thinking, such as that by Stevenson and Peace discussed in the early railroads? Should we conclude that rational analysis has great strength if the task is to improve an existing system and integrative analysis has its advantages elsewhere? We hear that some things can't be done because we lack basic knowledge and that there is a process. Innovation follows essential knowledge. That works in this way. Inquire, acquire knowledge. Invent, apply knowledge to new technology. Innovate, adapt technology to market niches. But is this consistent with observation? The basic knowledge for the steam engine is thermodynamics, and it had not yet been acquired. Yet practical men were working with the laws of thermodynamics. Essential knowledge may follow innovation. The first law of thermodynamics has to do with conservation of energy. Total energy was the sum of work plus loss. Efficiency was the percent of energy devoted to work. Inventors like Watt and Smeaton were working to convert lost energy into work. The second law of thermodynamics says efficiency rises by increasing working temperature and pressure, which Trevithick did, illustrating how what practical men did was suggestive to scientists and did not depend on them. The idea of the electron didn't appear until after innovators figured out a lot of things about power transmission, transformers, and multi-phase power. We are not saying that research and engineering don't contribute to building blocks for innovation. We object to the principle that research must be done first and argue that innovation may su suggest directions for useful research. Technology progresses with building blocks, but it does not progress top-down according to plan. Neither the ancient Greeks nor Romans nor Victorians had a plan for the modern jet engine. The early tinkerers with steam engines did not even have a steam locomotive in mind. Rather, they built something that suited them, and others took what they added to the community commons and extended it to create new, more complex building blocks. There has been a lot of recent study on how knowledge is created. The idea of adjacencies or the adjacent possible is valuable. Most ideas derive from existing nearby ideas, ideas in similar fields or approaching similar problems. This process is sometimes given the name bricolage, which is construction from a wide range of available objects. Another recent book notes that unlike people, technologies, and the ideas that embody them no longer die. Everything ever invented can still be found. The layers of technology involved in the modern world are too numerous to enumerate, but include fire, magnets, steam engine, electricity, wires, insulation, transistors, semiconductors, computers, software, network protocols, markup languages, and so on. Patents may constrain innovation. At the beginning of the book, inventors of steamboats competed for patents. These patents were developed to encourage an invention by giving inventors of intangible property, the idea underlying the invention, an exclusive monopoly on making that invention. The length of patents has increased across the board. It is widely disputed whether in that, in general, promotes or stifles innovation. It encourages innovation by rewarding expensive invention, which might not have otherwise taken place. It discourages it by limiting the amount of subsequent innovation, tying people in legal knots to bypass workable mechanisms to avoid losing all profits to the patent holder. In particular, patents can serve to gridlock the economy, creating a series of vertical monopolies, much like toll roads in series or tolls on the River Rhine. The problem with vertical monopolies is by taking as much profit from the customer as possible, 
they raise the price for the customer, who then lowers his demand not only for the good or service provided by the monopolist itself, but also for the upstream and downstream markets. We see this when toll roads are in series, but it also is important in patents. For instance, imagine party A owns a patent on water navigation, party B owns a patent on steam power, party C owns a patent on boats and flotation. By diminishing demand so much, the value for the system as a whole is reduced. There are strategies for this where the common good requires cooperation rather than competition in short-term profit maximizing. Innovation requires an adequate design serving the right market niche. While building blocks are necessary, they are not sufficient for innovation. The perfection of the new building block steam engine was not the key to innovation. This is analogous to Simon's satisficing paradigm. Fulton's key action was getting the market niche right. Quote, Prime Minister Pitt was the greatest fool that ever existed to encourage a mode of warfare which they who commanded the seas did not want and which if successful would deprive them of it, the English Admiral Earl St. Vincent commenting on the Fulton steamboat. Fulton spent two decades outside the United States working on inventions such as the submarine and torpedo for naval warfare. Small tub-sized canals interested Fulton. He developed and wrote about them and patented his ideas in France in 1798. Fulton developed the idea of submerged tunnels, and he also developed an idea for a submarine. Unable to sell the submarine idea in England, then at war with France, he went to France and got support for development and testing there. The submarine was to be used to break English blockades of channel ports. Development was not brought to that stage. While in France, Fulton developed a steamboat and held trials on the Seine at Paris. However, his boat was burned by bargemen and never saw service. Returning to England, Fulton was able to interest the English in submarine actions against the French fleet, but that scheme also went only part way. Before leaving England and returning to the United States, Fulton ordered a Bolton Watt engine, and this was the engine used on the Hudson River. The Hudson River service demonstrated feasibility and the existence of a market, and by 1820, there were about 300 steamboats in the United States service was available on the Ohio-Mississippi system. Policies may be forged to aid infant industries. The submarine was the archetypical infant industry. Fulton is quoted as describing the submarine, which he hoped would lead to what we might now call mutual assured destruction, and therefore end naval warfare and ensure freedom of the seas. An infant Hercules, which at one grasp will strangle the serpents, which poison and convulse the American Constitution. Policies may be forged to aid in infant industries, Often, however, infant industry is an excuse for subsidy rather than a reason. Once established, subsidies are hard to get rid of. Yet someone has to subsidize new industries to make the capital investment in research and development and to spend the capital costs needed for initial construction and manufacturing. That takes place before deployment results in funds returning to the proprietor. Whether that subsidy is public or private has historically varied by industry, and there is no one universal answer. The potential for improvements as the predominant technology emerges is critical. The steam engine wasn't successfully applied to wagons because, as the technology began to be deployed, it failed to improve in ways suited to steam cars. The main point in presenting this comment is to counter the argument that although the technology isn't so good now, if we can just get it started, costs will go down and quality will go up. That's the basis of infant industry claims for subsidy. An innovation has to be consistent with market or client values. The Royal Navy was a prospective client for the submarine, and as the quote from Earl St. Vincent at the top of the section suggests, its use wasn't consistent with the paradigms the Navy held about the correct ways to do battle. Perhaps if Fulton could interest Napoleon and build on his wish to eliminate the English blockade, he would have been successful. It would await World War I and especially World War II before the submarine would become central to naval warfare. Note that the steamboat on the Hudson wasn't consistent with the values held by sailboat operators. That didn't matter, for the passengers were the clients. Fulton moved to Pittsburgh and built the Washington for service on the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, where there was a growing market. A low-pressure steamboat, the Washington was a failure, insufficiently powered to steam upriver. But current wasn't the Ohio-Mississippi problem, for more powerful steamboats were within the state of the art and were soon in service. The problem was the state of the rivers, low water on the Ohio during much of the steaming season lack of navigation aids, log jams blocking rivers and snags, water-soaked logs often not visible, that would damage boats. It took many years in innovation by people like Captain Shreve to remove snags and improve the Ohio-Mississippi system. While well, going from New Orleans to Pittsburgh took about 120 days before steamboats, the application of steamboats reduced that time to 25 days, 
an 80% reduction. For a system to work, all components have to function appropriately. In the case of steamboats, this implies a steam engine, the mechanism for converting steam to power, the vehicle and the water system on which the steamboat is running. Steam railroads were also made to work, steam cars did not. Innovative people abound. The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. George Bernard Shaw. This book profiles many of the innovative people who changed transportation. The list of names mentioned is long. The list of unmentioned names is longer. As the Shaw quote at the beginning of the section notes, progress depends on the unreasonableness, changing the environment in which we act, bending space and time, instead of meekly accepting what the world deals. Innovators, who are unreasonable men in Shaw's now sexist words, do not take the situation as given. For example, Trevithick did not allow himself to be bound by the constraints posed by Watt's patents. Innovations must finesse existing constraints. Quote, the painter does not fit the paints to the world. He fits himself to the paint. Paul Clay. Quote, the visionary starts with a clean sheet of paper and reimagines the world. The tweaker inherits things as they are and has to push and pull them towards some more nearly perfect solution. That is not a lesser task. Malcolm Gladwell. Progress depends on the unreasonableness, but also depends on tweakers, those who finesse the system. They may be less remembered by history, but their collective work is just as important. Innovations must finesse existing constraints. Existing constraints, policies, regulations, standards, and so on, were generally put in place for good, though perhaps obsolete purposes. An innovation must adapt to those constraints or bend the constraints to adapt to the innovation. Brunel poses a good case study, facing constraints in both rail and shipping. Innovative people cooperate. Quote, a gift looks for recompense. Informal know-how trading between rivals as another source of innovation. Why would competitors share information? If the market has many competitors, sharing with one of many competitors may have few costs, especially if the favor is returned. Reciprocity is required. Excuses for inaction abound. Technical, regulatory, and social reasons can always be found why things can't be done. The quotations at the beginning of many chapters of this book provide examples of incorrect negativity. Of course, there are many things that are proposed that do not work for one reason or another, and we note a few of those as well. But we do not need to de determine success or failure in advance, and we should think of it as probabilistic. Investors in new technology should rightly take a lot of low-probability, high-payoff risks, as well as high-probability of success, low-payoff risks. The best are high-probability of success, high-payoff, of course, but these are usually not available. A tree may release thousands of seeds every year. It is lucky if one takes root and grows to adulthood. We don't decry the wasted seeds. We celebrate the full-grown tree. Innovators must overcome the excuses, not only disbelieving them, but persuading others, sources of capital especially, of their falsity. Innovation can be innovated. Can we innovate or automate the process of innovation? Can we innovate or automate the process of innovating the, the process of innovation? If innovation is to accelerate, we need to innovate faster. Testing one hypothesis at a time is good. Testing multiple hypotheses in parallel is better. Factories for innovation, as the classic Edison Labs at Menlo Park, New Jersey, aim to make innovation more efficient. While we do not see much of that in the first half of the 19th century, it becomes more and more widespread in the second half of the 19th century when Edison got to work, and especially in the 20th century. Certainly normal innovation working within the bounds of a well-known field is easier to automate than more profound innovations. If it is simply a question of filling out a matrix, testing 100 drugs against 10,000 known diseases, there are mechanisms for automating that which can be developed. Transportation development is chancy. The transportation experience is full of what might have beens, such as the what might have been discussed for the steam carriage. We should pay attention to these in the processes of selection and choice that affected them. Bolton first tried his steamboat in Paris. It steamed very well the first day, but was burned that night by bargemen concerned about their investment and their jobs. With the extensive canal system in place in France, success by Fulton might have set off technology development suited to canals. If the Duke of Bridgewater had lived to purchase and use Simontine's designs, similar developments might have happened in England. Instead, the first developments were riverboats. We see many what might have beens as we trace the transportation experience. Often chance is discounted in favor of choice. Choices were made driven by the tooth and claw of competition. Best choices are assumed to have been made. Even if one accepts that the tooth and claw of competition was less than perfect, what's done is done. 
Development is an irreversible process and our concern should be with today's outcomes. We disagree.